Nice Nigun. In fact, it's just called Nigun by Eitan Katz on his album Unplugged 2. How's everybody doing? A good vach shavua tov, a good week to you. It's great to be learning with you on a Saturday night. Wow, I admire you so much. You're starting your week right, especially if you're on the East Coast. Wow, I know it's so late. Let's get into it. Let's light up the darkness. Who is with us on a Saturday night, starting the week off with some beautiful Talmud learning? Nancy, North Carolina, John in Maine, uh, Bella in Florida, Lucy in Minnesota, Zach Plotzker got tremendous good news. Wow, I'm so happy to hear that. He's been awaiting a transplant, a kidney transplant, and he got a date, June 28th. Zach, that's wonderful. May the procedure be super successful, and you'll be good as new. You and your donor will have tremendous health. I am so happy to hear this news. I have been praying for you three times a day, every day, so I am so, so happy to hear this news. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Ryan with us from Jacksonville, Florida. Jeff in Anchorage, Alaska. Evelyn in Kentucky. And Aoife in Florida. Welcome, everybody. Okay. We are in chapter 6 here in Tractate Yevamos, the 14th volume of the Talmud. These are the laws of Yibum, Leveret marriage. We're in chapter 6, and today on page 61, Samech Aleph, we are opening a new Mishnah here in chapter 6. We'll be doing Mishnah number 4, and we'll actually be doing Mishnah number 5 as well. Mishnah number four here in chapter six. If a priest betrothed a widow. So here in chapter six, pursuant to understanding the laws of Yibum, we're understanding what exactly is the Yibum uh, procedure itself, which is when a man dies childless who is married and his brother steps in uh, and marries the widow. And to do that, he performs intercourse with his sister-in-law. Uh, and so we've been looking at that, you know, the definitions and ramifications and nuances of intercourse. And that's led us into some interesting areas uh, here in Jewish law. But interestingly, we've been also talking quite a bit about priests uh, when the temple is standing, a Kohen, the Kohanim, plural, and particularly the Kohen Gadol. Why? Because a priest is prohibited from marrying a divorced woman and a high priest is prohibited even from marrying a widow. Very restrictive who a high priest can marry. And of course, the Yibum situation is all about a widow. Uh, so can a high priest ever perform Yibum? Uh, we shall see. Okay, so Mishnah. If a priest betrothed a widow and was subsequently appointed to be high priest. Now, this is not a Yibum situation. It's just that a high priest is not allowed to marry a widow. Well, before he became the high priest, what if he was a priest uh, and he was betrothed to a widow and he hadn't uh, consummated that union yet and then he was elevated to high priest? Is he forced to break off that betrothal? If a priest betrothed the widow and was subsequently appointed to be high priest, he may marry her. And there was an incident with Yehoshua ben Gamla, who betrothed Marta bat Baitos, a widow, and the king subsequently appointed him to be high priest, and he nevertheless married her. Conversely, in the case of a widow waiting for her Yavam, who happened before a common priest, i.e. the priest was her Yavam, right? So she was married to a priest and he died childless. So now her, his brother is another priest, right? So they're both Kohanim. Uh, and so now she's before her Yavam, uh, who happened before a... So she comes before her Yavam, who is a common priest, meaning not a, a high priest. <clears throat> and he was subsequently appointed to be high priest. Then, even if he had already performed leveret betrothal with her, that was not necessary to perform yibum, but is the correct way to do it. Even if he had performed leveret betrothal with her, he may not marry her. So it's an interesting distinction that if a priest 
was betrothed to a widow and then he became high priest, he may marry her. But if a priest had performed levirate betrothal with his Yevama after his brother died, uh, and then he's elevated to high priest, he may not marry her. And we'll get into that distinction in a moment. Uh, but let me just read to you a little bit about these personalities mentioned in our Mishnah. Uh, so this priest who became high priest, Yehoshua ben Gamla, uh, who betrothed Marta Basbetos. Yehoshua ben Gamla, referred to by Josephus, the, uh, the Jewish historian in Rome, uh, referred to by Josephus as Yehoshua ben Gamliel, was apparently one of the last high priests in the Second Temple. He was appointed by King Agrippa II, and he was killed during the destruction of the Second Temple. Although the sages criticized the way he became high priest, they also noted his good deeds. He was praised for donating golden lots for the Yom Kippur service, Right, the, the Yom Kippur, right? We, there's two lots, one for uh, over the two goats or the scapegoat that's going to Azazel and the other one that was sacrificed on the altar and how we choose them was with two lots and he donated golden lots for that purpose, uh, for the Yom Kippur service. And he was especially commended for expanding the circle of Jewish education by establishing an extensive network of schools in every town in the land of Israel it is even said that were it not for him, the Torah would have been forgotten from the Jewish people. However, some claim that there were two men with the same name, Yehoshua ben Gamla, and the Yehoshua ben Gamla mentioned here in our Mishnah is not the one who established the network of schools. So it's a little unclear if he is that man or not, uh, but if it seems that most say he is, some say he's not. So according to most opinions or commentaries, uh, this is the man who basically originated the public school system uh, for the Jewish people. And it's amazing, amazing, amazing person who was also appointed to be high priest. Now, who was Marta Batbaitos, right? To, or Bas Beitos, Marta, the daughter of Beitos, uh, who, uh, you know, was a widow that he betrothed as a priest and then was allowed to marry her when he became high priest. Marta Basbetos uh, is mentioned in several places in the Talmud. Due to her great wealth, she has served throughout the ages as the archetype of a very wealthy woman. The house of Betos was one of the most powerful and wealthy families of priests in Jerusalem, and many members of this household served as high priest or in other important positions in the temple. According to the Jerusalem Talmud, Marta married Yehoshua ben Gamla, as a result of trickery on his part. And yet, after becoming betrothed to him, she sought to secure him the most elevated position possible. And the Talmud relates that during the siege of Jerusalem, all her wealth was to no avail and she died of starvation. Now, we read... Uh or we will, men I guess we will mention that the king, does it say which king appointed her? I mean, we won't read that note. At any rate, so these are, these are the two people that we're talking about. So that was uh, in the Mishnah, Mishnah number four here in chapter six. Now the Gemara, the sages taught, from where is it derived that if a priest betrothed the widow and he was subsequently appointed to be high priest, that he may still marry her, even though a high priest is not allowed to marry a widow. The fact that he was betrothed to her already Perhaps what it means is he's not allowed to marry a widow, but if he's already married to her, he need not divorce her. And betrothal is a form of marriage, even though that union hasn't been consummated. If you want to break off a betrothal, uh, right, Erosin, to break that off, you need a get, a bill of divorce. And perhaps that's why he's allowed to go ahead and marry her. Whereas... Right in a in a yibum situation, even if you perform levirate betrothal, underlying that there's something else, which is that you have a levirate bond with her because she's your brother's widow, and that is a different basis uh, for proceeding forward. So the sage is taught from where is it derived that if a priest betrothed a widow and was subsequently appointed to be high priest, then he may marry her. The verse states, "Shall he take for a wife?" In Leviticus twenty one fourteen an inclusive phrase that indicates that he may marry her in this situation despite the general prohibition for a high priest to marry a widow. 
And the Gemara asks, if so, a widow waiting for her Yavam should also be permitted to a high priest. And the Gemara answers, the word wife indicates that this does not include a Yavama who is not initially his wife, but his brother's. And the Mishnah related an incident with Yehoshua ben Gamla. So the Gemara notes that the Mishnah states that the king appointed him. Yes, but not that he was worthy of being appointed. And Rav Yosef said, I see a conspiracy here, as this was clearly not a proper appointment by the priests and the Sanhedrin, but rather a political appointment. As Rav Asi said, Marta Batbetos, Marta Batbetos brought a vessel the size of a half saw full of dinars, a tremendous amount of money to King Yanai until he appointed Yehoshua ben Gamla high priest. Who was this King Yanai? As Tosafos note, it is inconceivable that this could have been Yanai, the Hasmonean king, as he himself was a high priest, right? Remember the, the, the ones who became king after the Hasmonean uh, war, which is the Hanukkah story, uh, were the descendants of Matis Yahu, who was himself a priest. Uh, and so this king Yanai was the high priest and the king, and he would not have given up the position to someone else. So the sages referred to several kings from the Second Temple era as Yanai to indicate their disapproval of these kings' actions. And actually, that completes our discussion of Mishnah number four. Now, Mishnah number five. A high priest who died without children performs chalitza, and he, I'm sorry, a high priest whose brother died without children, the high priest performs chalitza, and he does not perform leveret marriage, as he may not marry a widow. We had that question the other night in the comments, and there it is, a very simple, one of the shortest missions we've ever encountered, very straightforward. Right? A high priest may not marry a widow, so if the high priest has a brother who's married, and he dies without having children, and so that widow comes before the high priest, he may not marry her, period. He must perform chalitza with her, the alternative to yibum. Now the Gemara. The Mishnah teaches this halacha, this law, categorically, indicating that it is no different if she is his brother's widow from betrothal, and it is no different if she is his widow from marriage. And the Gemara analyzes this law. Granted, she is forbidden to him if she was widowed from marriage, as if he were to marry her, it would be a violation of both the positive mitzvah, he must marry a virgin, uh, and the prohibition that he may not marry a widow, a prohibition that stems from a positive mitzvah, and also a positive mitzvah, but, and a positive mitzvah, in this case, levered marriage, the positive mitzvah to perform yibum with your brother's widow, does not override both a prohibition and a positive mitzvah together. However, if she was a widow from betrothal, and is therefore she's still a virgin, so he could be marrying a woman who was betrothed but is still a virgin, so then the positive mitzvah of levirate marriage should come and override the prohibition for a high priest to marry a widow, uh, or meaning should override the positive mitzvah that he marry a widow, since, uh, I'm sorry, the, pro, the, the positive mitzvah of yibum should come and override the negative mitzvah of he may not marry a widow, since there's no virgin, uh, being vi no virgin prohibition being violated if his brother was only betrothed to this woman. So why doesn't this positive mitzvah of Yibum come and override the prohibition uh, of the widow? And the Gemara answers, by Torah law, leveret marriage is permitted in this case. However, so, so by Torah law, it would be permitted. However, there is a rabbinic decree prohibiting their first act of intercourse due to their second act of intercourse. Right? The first act of intercourse that they have would be for the purpose of building up the brother's house. After that, right, they're not they're, they're, or, or, or to perform yibum. The first act of intercourse is for the purpose of performing yibum. Thereafter, uh, he's now with a woman who is not a virgin and she's a widow, and so there's two violations. And so as a matter of Torah law, it would be permitted, but as a rabbinic decree, they said no. And that concludes our discussion of Mishnah number five. Now we go to Mishnah number six here in chapter six. 
Mishnah, a common priest may not marry a sexually underdeveloped woman and a lonus who is incapable of bearing children unless he already has a wife and children. Why is it that a priest cannot marry an Elonis in a Yibum situation? Uh, I'm sorry, there's no Yibum here. Why is it that a common priest may not marry a woman who is incapable of bearing children unless he already has a wife? Why? Uh, Rabbi Yehuda says, even if he has a wife and children, he may not marry a sexually underdeveloped woman. By underdeveloped, they don't mean so young that she's not able to have children when she gets older. They mean a woman who is sterile, that she will never be able to have children. So Rabbi Yehuda says, even if he has a wife and children, he may not marry a sexually underdeveloped woman as she is the zona about whom it is stated in the Torah that a priest may not marry her. By the way, this prohibition that we're talking about right now is in this week's Torah portion that just we started reading this afternoon, uh, Torah portion Emor. So that doesn't always happen, rarely happens, that the laws we're discussing about on a given day of Daf Yomi happen right in the week and in fact in the day since we were reading this passage uh, at the beginning of the Parsha this afternoon. But now we are talking about something that is current in both Daf Yomi and the Torah reading cycle. So Rabbi Yehuda says, even if he has a wife and children, he may not marry this sexually underdeveloped woman as she is the zona about whom it is stated in the Torah that a priest may not marry her. Why? Intercourse with her is considered a licentious act because she is incapable of bearing children. And the rabbis say the only women in the category of zona who are therefore forbidden to a priest are a female convert, a freed maidservant, and any woman who is engaged in licentious sexual intercourse with a man she is prohibited from marrying. Now, that last group, uh, you know, that, 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 that last category, a woman who is engaged in licentious sexual intercourse with a man she's prohibited from marrying, that's a little bit more what we think of when we think of this Hebrew word zona, which in modern Hebrew means a prostitute. But as we'll see, that is not what this word means in the Torah. Uh, here's the, uh, the, the halacha. Who is considered a zona? A woman who had intercourse with a man she is prohibited from marrying, she's a zona. But also a Gentile or a slave is classified as a zona and is forbidden to a priest. So this classification of a zona is not a commentary on, you know, was this woman, you know, who was sleeping around. That is not what it means in this context at all. What it means is she's going to be prohibited for a priest to marry. And priests, as we've seen, uh, are very limited in who they are permitted to marry as opposed to all other Jews. Priests have very, very special uh, prohibitions on who they're able to marry. Uh, so for these purposes, who's considered a zona, right? This woman had intercourse with a man she's prohibited from marrying or a Gentile or a slave. Uh, and they're all prohibited to a priest. However, if she was prohibited from marrying only a priest, but permitted to marry other Jewish men, and she had intercourse with a priest, she is not classified as a zona, right? She's not going to be permitted to marry that priest, uh, or, or she's already prohibited, but if she had sex with the priest, that doesn't make her a zona. And the category of zona also includes a female convert and a freed maidservant. Now, there's no they're not making some kind of a commentary on women from these groups. It's just that for various technical reasons, they're not permitted to marry a priest, as we shall see. Uh, okay, that was the Mishnah. Now, the Gemara. The Exilarch, so the head of the Jewish community in Babylonia in ancient times, the Exilarch said to Rav Huna, what is the reason for the law that a priest may not marry a sexually underdeveloped woman, the Elonis? It is because he is obligated to fulfill the mitzvah, the commandment, to be fruitful and multiply, peru urivu. Is it only priests who were commanded to be fruitful and multiply, but Israelites were not commanded? All Jewish men are commanded to be fruitful and multiply. 
Uh, why does the Mishnah specify that a priest may not marry a sexually underdeveloped woman? How is a priest different from other Jewish men? And Rav Huna said to him, this law does in fact apply even to Israelites. And the Tana of our Mishnah mentions priests because he wants to teach it in a way that would parallel the latter clause of the Mishnah, which states that Rabbi Yehuda says, even if he has a wife and he has children, he may not marry a sexually underdeveloped woman, as she is the zona uh, about whom it is stated in the Torah that a priest may not marry her. But a regular Israelite man, a regular Jew, who's not a, uh, a regular Jewish man who's not a priest, is not prohibited from marrying a zona. He may marry a zona. Uh, it is priests who were commanded not to marry a zona, but Israelites were not commanded in this. It is due to that reason that the rabbi of our Mishnah taught the first clause of the Mishnah about a priest, even though the law applies equally to Israelites. Right. So according to that law, uh, because a man is command commanded to be fruitful and multiply, uh, he should not marry a woman who is sterile because she will prohibit, she will, you know, prevent him from mul being fruitful and multiplying, which means to have two kids. Uh, as we'll see uh, in the next mission, uh, according to Be Shammai, it's enough if you have two boys. According to Be, it's only enough. You've only uh, uh, fulfilled that commandment when you've had two sons. According to Be Hillel, when you have fathered at least a boy and a girl. So Rav Huna said, what is the reason for the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda? Uh, as it is written in Hosea 4.10, and they shall eat and not have enough. They shall commit harlotry and shall not increase. And he expounds this verse as follows. Any intercourse that does not have the possibility to increase the population because the woman is incapable of having children is nothing other than licentious sexual intercourse. Now, there's a lot of qualifications that we've already seen to this principle. This is not the final word on this principle because, for example, uh, if a couple is married and, you know, the woman then becomes incapable of having children, you're not forced to divorce her. Uh, or, for example, you know, after a woman has ceased in the way of women right after menopause, uh, then the husband is still obligated to please his wife and, and to have relations with his wife just to make her happy. So it's not that all marital relations are only for the purpose of having children, but it is a fact that Jewish men are commanded to peru urivu, be fruitful and multiply. It is taught in a baraisa that Rabbi Eliezer says a priest may not marry a minor. Rav Chizda said to Rabbi, go and investigate this law. As in the evening, Rav Huna will ask you the reason for Rabbi Eliezer's ruling. So he went and investigated it, and he arrived at the following conclusion. Rabbi Eliezer holds in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Meir, and he also holds in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda. And Rabbi explains, he holds in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Meir, who says that one must be concerned for the minority. Rabbi Meir does not allow one to assume that an unknown case is similar to the majority of cases. It might be that the unknown case turns out to be like the minority of cases. Consequently, one must take into account the possibility that if you marry a minor, you don't know whether she's going to be capable of having children or not. She may end up being this alonus who's sexually underdeveloped and won't ever be able to have children because her organs are not developed to have children. Consequently, one must take into account that possibility, and although this will not be true of most individuals, he shouldn't marry a woman until it's clear, you know, just from outward signs that she has the possibility of having children. And he also holds in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda, who said that a sexually underdeveloped woman is a zona and therefore forbidden to a priest. Now, the Gemara challenges Rabbi's explanation. And does Rabbi Eliezer hold in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Meir? Isn't it taught in a Baraisa? A boy minor and a girl minor may not perform chalitza or yibum. This is the statement of Rabbi Meir. And the Rabbi said to Rabbi Meir, you spoke well when you said that they may not perform chalitza, as the term man is written in the passage of chalitza in Deuteronomy 25.7 which limits the law to an adult male. So only an adult male can perform chalitza if uh, his yavama comes before him for yibum. And we compare a man to a woman, and therefore we limit chalitza to an adult woman as well. However, what is the reason that they may not perform yibum? And Rabbi Meir said to them, 
a boy minor may not perform yibum lest he be found to be a eunuch, i.e. one who is incapable of fathering children for his late brother. Therefore, if he performed yibum, it would be an act without the possibility of fathering children, which was the purpose of yibum. And since we don't know whether he will be able to do that or not, we don't allow him to be for- perform yibum until he is an adult. Similarly, a girl minor may not perform yibum lest she be found to be sexually underdeveloped when she grows up. In either case, the commandment of yibum does not apply and they turn out to have encountered a forbidden relative, right? The fact is their brother-in-law and sister-in-law, uh, because, right, his brother died and this is his widow. Uh, so if it's not to have children in the name of the brother who died, then it's a prohibited relationship. And it was taught in a different Baraisa, a girl minor enters into levirate marriage but does not perform chalitza. This is the statement of Rabbi Eliezer. This proves that Rabbi Eliezer disagrees with Rabbi Meir and is not concerned that a girl may turn out to be sexually underdeveloped when they allow her to enter this yibum. So the Gemara continues to challenge Rabbi's explanation of Rabbi Eliezer's ruling. And does Rabbi Eliezer hold in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda? Wasn't it taught in a Baraisa? The zona, forbidden to a priest, is as the name zona implies, i.e. a married woman who committed adultery. This is the statement of Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Akiva disagrees. He says a zona is a woman, even an unmarried woman, who is available to all, i.e. she has intercourse with whoever is interested. Rabbi Matia ben Harash says, even if her husband went to make her drink the bitter waters after she disregarded his warning not to seclude herself with a certain man, and then they're on their way to Jerusalem to perform that ceremony. And once the husband has warned her not to seclude herself with a man he suspects of cheating with his wife, and then she secludes herself with that man again, uh, despite his warning, now they, the husband and wife become prohibited to each other until she's drunk the bitter waters. Uh, so if now the husband and wife have intercourse together after they become prohibited to each other because of that, the warning of the sota, uh, then they had sex that they were prohibited to have, and that renders her a zona, according to Rabbi Matia ben Harash. Rabbi Yehuda says a zona is a sexually under, underdeveloped woman. No bearing on her morals or who she's sleeping around with. It's just she's somebody who's incapable of mothering children. And so if she, you know, according to Rabbi Yehuda, Uh, She's the Zona just for the purpose of marrying a priest. She's not a Zona in general. It's just that a priest can't marry her. And the rabbis say the term Zona applies only to a female convert, a freed maidservant, and one who engaged in licentious sexual intercourse. Rabbi Luzer says even in the case of an unmarried woman who had intercourse with an unmarried man, not for the purpose of marriage, he has thereby caused her to become a Zona. And this Baraisa proves that Rabbi Eliezer does not agree with Rabbi Yehuda. Now again, these are all different definitions from the rabbis of what is a zona. But it's not some kind of aspersion against her. I mean, obviously if they're talking about this woman of loose morals who's sleeping with everybody, they're judging her. They're they're definitely unfavorable toward her. But the purpose of this discussion is who is a zona that a priest may not marry. That's the only halachic implication of this so far. Now, rather, Rav Adah Barahava said that Rabbi Eliezer's ruling that a priest may not marry a minor should be explained differently. Here we are dealing with a high priest, and the problem is as follows. When can he acquire her as his wife? Only when she is grown up. However, if they had started living together as a husband and wife when she was a minor, then when she is grown up and the marriage can legally take effect, she is already a non-virgin and a high priest is commanded to marry a virgin. Ravis said this explanation is without reason. If her father betrothed her to her husband, her husband acquired her from that time as betrothal that a father carries out on his daughter's behalf when she is a minor is effective by Torah law as opposed to uh, betrothal that if the father died, betrothal that her mother or brothers carry out, uh, she can refuse it. And if the minor betrothed herself, is this Rabbi Eliezer's opinion and not that of the rabbis? The rabbis would certainly agree that a high priest may not marry a minor under these circumstances. Rather, Rava said, actually, Rabbi Eliezer's ruling includes a common priest. 
And the reason he cannot marry a minor is that we are concerned lest she be seduced by another man due to her tender age and naivete while married to him. And the Gemara asks, if so, the same concern should apply to an Israelite also, just any Jewish man. And the Gemara answers, the seduction of a minor is considered rape. And a rape victim remains permitted to her husband in a case where she is married to an Israelite, but not if she is married to a priest. Again, the the, the very limited, uh, you know, the, 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 the very extensive restrictions that apply to a priest do not apply to all the other Jewish men, right? And it's nice to actually see this, even though we've had so many discussions, uh, you know, of marriage and, 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 and yibum and betrothal inviting, you know, involving children. Uh, it's nice to just have it stated here straight out. The seduction of a minor is rape. Right? And a rape victim remains permitted to her husband because she did nothing wrong. And even though she did nothing wrong, the rape victim does not remain permitted to a priest because the priest is held to this incredibly high standard. Uh, and he won't be able to marry uh, you know, people who've undergone this stuff or that's not a virgin in the case of a high priest. So Rav Papa said Rabbi Eliezer's ruling applies specifically to a high priest. And it is the opinion of this Tana as it is taught in a Baraisa that when the verse states in Leviticus 21, 14, a virgin of his own people shall he take for a wife, Isha, one might have thought a high priest may marry a minor. And the verse therefore states that he must marry a woman, Isha, i.e. an adult. If he must marry a woman, one might have thought it must, means a grown woman. The verse therefore states he must marry a virgin, which excludes a grown woman who is considered only a partial virgin because her hymen is not fully intact. How so? So he must marry a woman who has left the class of the minority, but who has not yet reached the class of grown woman, i.e. he must marry a maiden. And Rav Nachman bar Yitzhak said, it is the opinion of this Tana, as it is taught in a Baraisa, the high priest must marry a virgin, and the term virgin refers only to a maiden. And a verse similarly states, and the maiden was very fair to look upon, a virgin, and no man had known her, in Genesis 24, 16. The Baraisa cited above mentioned that Rabbi Elazar says, in the case of an unmarried man who had intercourse with an unmarried woman, not for the purpose of marriage, he has caused her to become his zona. And Rav Amram said, the law is not in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Elazar. And that concludes our discussion of Mishnah number six. It's one of, yes, yeah, so we get toward the end of a chapter, the Mishnahs start piling up fast. Uh, now we're going to look at Mishnah number seven, and we're just going to do the very beginning of the commentary on it. And then I'm going to take questions or comments. So if you got any, put them in the comments now. Mishnah number seven, a man may not neglect the mitzvah to be fruitful and multiply, peru uravu, unless he already has children. Beisham, I say, one fulfills his mitz this mitzvah with two males, and Beis Hillel say, a male and a female. As it is stated, Genesis 5, 2, male and female, he created them. So you're imitating what God did. God made a male and a female. So every man must make a male and a female to be fruitful and multiply. That's Mishnah number seven. Here's the Gemara, just the opening of the Gemara. The Gemara infers from the Mishnah's wording that if he already has children, he may neglect the mitzvah to be fruitful and multiply, but he may not neglect the mitzvah to have a wife. And this supports what Rav Nachman said in the name of Shmuel, who said, even if a man has several children, it is prohibited to remain without a wife. As it is stated, you can, I'm sure, imagine where that's from, Genesis 2.18, it is not good that the man should be alone. Therefore, man should properly be married. And some say a different version of the inference from the Mishnah. If he already has children, he may neglect the mitzvah to be fruitful and multiply, and he may also neglect the mitzvah to have a wife. Shall we say this is a conclusive refutation of what Rav Nachman said that Shmuel said? And the Gemara responds, no, <laughs> no. It means that if he does not have children, he must marry a woman capable of bearing children. Whereas if he has children, he may marry a woman who is not capable of bearing children, but he must be married. A practical difference between a man who has children and one who does not is whether he is permitted to sell a Torah scroll in order to marry a woman capable of having children. This is permitted only for one who does not yet have children. And that concludes our discussion for tonight. We'll pick it up tomorrow, the regular time, Sunday through Thursday, 6 p.m. Pacific. 
Let's see if we've got any comments or questions here on Yevamos page 61. Uh, Sharon, Rabbi Menachem Schneerson, the Chabad Rebbe, and his wife had no children. Should they have divorced and remarried to attempt for, for him to have children? Uh, I mean, it doesn't say that, right? It doesn't say that. And also, uh, all of these laws, which uh, we're discussing in the Mishnah and the Gemara, took their final shape uh, in the year about 500 of the Common Era when it was still permitted to have multiple wives. And about a thousand years ago, uh, it became a, a rabbinic decree that a man could only have one wife. Now that's going to have an effect on this, right? So, Sharon, you're right. Like, if it's an absolute command to Peru or Revu to be fruitful and multiply, uh, and you discover that the wife that you're married to, like, you have no reason to believe this before you got married, so it was certainly permitted to marry, and then later it turns out she can have children, uh, so then do you need to get divorced? Uh, but we don't ha we don't really have that, right? Because it, what it would have meant back then is that you would take another wife so you could have children. There, so there was never a, an obligation to divorce your wife if you can't have children with her. And women are not obligated to reproduce. Only men are. Um, so it's a great question. Uh, you know, and I'm sure it's something that the Rebbe thought about. Uh, and, you know, all, there's also adoption and there's, a, you know, in vitro and all kinds of things. Although those kinds of things were much less available, uh, you know, when they were in there. I mean, he became the Rebbe uh, when he was about 50 years old in 1950. You know, so there was just a lot less possible in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, they were also coming from a place, I mean, you know, they were refugees uh, from the old world and they, they, they had time in Siberia and Russia and the previous Rebbe, etc. Uh, so I certainly can't comment, in, comment on the nuances of their decisions. Uh, but it seems to me that we don't have any kind of an obligation like that, that if it turns out that the wife can't have children, that you should divorce and, and find somebody who can. Um, it's just, you know, it wasn't possible for you. Likewise, a man, you know, he, every man is obligated to be fruitful and multiply, but a man, you know, might, might turn out to be physically incapable of having children. So he just can't fulfill that obligation. Um, and I will say that this is just my own little teaching that I've shared uh, before. Uh, I don't really have a solid basis from this, from other, you know, Torah, from, from rabbis and Torah commentators. It's just my own little thing. Uh, that I offer, but it seems to me that if be fruitful and multiply, peru urivu, only meant have children, only meant reproduce, it would have been enough to say revu, multiply. You're obligated to multiply. Be fruitful, I think, you know, I, I, I suggest it's possible that it means something else, right? Uh, and it's interesting that it's the first part of that phrase. Uh, so be fruitful, I think, means to fulfill your soul's mission in this world, right? To figure out what only you can give the world and give it. Bear fruit in this world. Uh, and, you know, having children is one way to bear fruit and to help create the next generation. But there's many other ways to bear fruit in this world, to use your creativity, uh, to use your kindness, your largesse. Uh, to be philanthropic, to give to good causes, to take care of people, to take in, the, to take care of the sick, to take in, you know, guests who are refugees. I mean, there's many, many ways to be fruitful in this world. Uh, and I think it's an important question that we should all ask ourselves all the time. Am I bearing fruit in this world? Am I giving the world that which only I can give the world? Uh, and, you know, you may not know the answer to that question, but to start asking that question, you know, is to start getting the answer to that question. Um, right. And so and, and so on the question, what is the zona? I mean, probably that was asked uh, before we got into it. You see, we don't have a clear definition. The sages themselves are all arguing. What does it mean? Uh, but really, it seems to whereas some, Often that word is just used to mean a prostitute. Even in the Torah, sometimes it's used to mean that. It clearly, that's not its only meaning. 
And so when we get to the place that a priest may not marry a zona, who is included in that definition, uh, and there are several categories of women, it has nothing to do with the way that they behave. Uh, it's just the circumstances of their life can render them prohibited to a priest under this category, but it's not, you know, because they were licentious in some way. Okay, I guess that's all the questions that we've got. It's great to uh, start the week beautifully like this, learning with you, my holy sisters and brothers. Uh, and may you all be blessed to be fruitful and multiply, well, at least to be fruitful uh, this week. A good vok, shavuot tov, and I look forward to learning with you tomorrow.